Flip it on that slide bar up there. It'd be awesome. What an awesome God we serve today. How many is glad to be in Sunday school? Praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands to the Lord if you're glad to be in Sunday school. Hallelujah. I know we got classes all over the campus today, and uh, I know it's uh, probably some will be coming in here in a few moments as well. But I, I'm always trying to be an on-time person. I don't like to drag my feet and, and be late for nothing, especially church. Now, the only thing I want to be late for is my funeral. <laughs> I, I don't mind being late for that. But uh, ushers are come. We'll get our Sunday school offering out of the way this morning, give you a chance to give. This helps take care of our Sunday school literature and, and what have you as we go forth. And I uh, just love the Lord. I just love what I feel already in the, even this prayer time, even last night until now. I feel the Holy Ghost in the sanctuary and so thankful for the time we have to pray together. Brother Terry, I mean, Brother uh, Hill, would you ask the Lord to bless this offering? Bless you. Go get the offering if you guys would. And uh, Brother Brad, would you come on and feed us the word of the Lord this morning? Everybody say, Lord, use Brother Brad. Get your Bibles open. Let's, let's follow along. And uh, most of the scripture will be on the board as well. But let's follow along and see what God has for us today. Brother Brad. Well, praise the Lord, everyone, this morning. One more time, lift up your hands and lift up your voices in the presence of the Lord. I'm already feeling the Holy Ghost, the anointing of God. Father, we love you, O Lord. God, we give you praise and honor and sincere worship and adoration this morning. And Father, we pray, O Lord God, you'll stretch forth your hand that it's not short, Lord. It's not shortened that it cannot save, Lord, and your ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. And we're thankful, Lord, that your eyes are always over the righteous. And Father, your ears are open unto our cry, unto our prayer. And we pray, Lord, your will to be done in all things. You'll bless your people, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and clap your hands unto the Lord. And somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Ah, hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. I'll tell you, I'm excited about this Bible lesson this morning. I had mentioned the other day, I think it was to Sister Johnson and Brother Johnson, how it was Wednesday night, how at about 11.15, Monday night, laying on the bed about half asleep, God gave me this, I'll call it a message for this class, not just a lesson, but I believe a message, and it came so quickly and so mightily, I had to get out of bed, and I began to just scribble down notes faster than, than I guess I've ever written them before, because they came so fast and so direct by the Holy Ghost of God. And so I'm excited. There may not be many here today, but I know that God has given me this message, this lesson for you that are here and for you that are watching by the way of the web. We pray God's greatest blessing upon you and upon your loved ones this morning in Jesus' mighty name. If you would turn to the great book of Leviticus, chapter 17 and verse 11. And I'm going to teach this morning from this thought, the powerful blood of Christ. Would you say that with me? The powerful blood of Christ. Now, I've taught this in the past from the title, the precious blood of Christ, but I'm going to simply say the powerful blood of Christ. Leviticus chapter 17, the book of Leviticus basically means the matters of the Levites. We find in this book, the duties and responsibilities of the Levites, the priest of God. So it means the matters of Levites, and it's kind of like a manual for God's Old Testament priest. And Moses, the man of God, said to the priest of God by the Spirit of the Lord, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Everyone say the blood, and I have given it you, or to you, upon the altar to make an, everyone say, atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. If you would go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, for our second text. The apostle said, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You know, Revelation 13, 8, you don't have to turn there, reads in part that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. I'm glad you have your Bibles, pen and paper that tells me you're interested in studying and learning God's Word, and you're not just here to be doing something, <laughs> but you're here to learn. But notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, again, verses 18 through 20, Peter said, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, this tells me, brothers and sisters, he is implying that what we were redeemed by was incorruptible. And that is the precious blood of Christ. Here's what I say, Brother Turner. Not one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ saw corruption. It did not rot on Mount Calvary, Golgotha, the Hebrew, and Calvary, Latin. It did not rot on the place of the skull or on that mountain about 2,000 years ago. Not one drop of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ saw corruption. It didn't deteriorate or rot in the dirt or upon the wood of the cross or when he was beaten with, as some would call it, the cat of nine tails. Not one drop saw corruption. The Bible says we were redeemed with things that are not corruptible things, but something that was not corruptible, and that is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Years ago, many years ago, they found a what they feel to be a burial cloth. It's a long cloth and has an imprint or an image of a man in that cloth. It's called the Shroud of Turin. You may have seen it on television in times past, and it looks as though it was a burial cloth that laid upon a man's body who had been crucified. And they were saying there was probably the... the the cloth or that laid upon the body of Christ, the way they worded it. But when I saw that the man had long hair, I instantly knew that wasn't Christ. But what really stood out to me, brothers and sisters, is this. They said that there was blood in that cloth. There was blood stains in that fabric for all of these many years. And when I heard that, Brother Johnson, as Brother Wade Hall used to say, eh, eh, wrong answer. Because not one drop of the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins saw corruption. Hmm. Psalm 16.10 and Acts 2.27 tells us that even the body of the Holy One did not see corruption. Sister Turner, Jesus' body was raised from the dead and God's Holy One, Zachariah said Jehovah's fellow, did not see corruption. And his blood did not rot on Mount Calvary. And I'm going to get into the blood because when he ascended up into the heavens, the holy places, he's going to sprinkle the mercy seat of God Almighty with his own blood. I say thank God for the blood this morning. Go ahead and clap your hands unto the Lord. Ah, thank God. It's powerful and it's precious. I got my dictionary out as I was putting this together. And the word precious simply means of high cost or worth. Precious means it is valuable. It is dear and beloved. Do you feel that way about the blood of Christ? Not just because it was blood, but because of what that blood did. Thank God he redeemed us unto God by his own blood. You cost God something this morning. I cost God something this morning. And it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats could do it. It wasn't silver and gold. Come on now. But it was the precious, incorruptible blood of the Lamb of God. I say thank God for the blood. Thank God it is for our atonement. Romans 5.11, the Apostle Paul said in part, we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the, everyone say, the atonement. 
I looked up the word atonement. I had a good idea, but I want to give a definition from Webster. Atonement means reparation made for an injury, wrong, or sin. So I looked up reparation. You're hearing that on the news a lot, a lot these days, reparation. Reparation is something done or paid to make amends. I thank God that atonement was made for our sins by the death and the bloodshed of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice, John said, for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Brother Turner, he's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I say there's power, wonder-working power in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. Do you believe that in adult Bible class this morning? I may get loose and preach here under the anointing of God. He gave it to me with power in that night revelation, if you will, or visitation, and I want to deliver it accurately, precisely under the anointing of the Holy Lord God. I like what man, one man wrote in a book many years ago. He said, the work is completely done. The veil has been rent. The blood applied. Sin is atoned for. God and sinners are reconciled. The law has been satisfied and believers are justified. The Bible said we're justified by the blood of Christ. Come on now. We're justified by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and in his bloodshed on Mount Calvary, the place of the skull. Thank God for the blood. Just a turn of the Bible says by Paul to Timothy, his son in the faith, he said of Christ, he is the Savior of all men, especially to them that have believed. Have you believed this morning? Oh, he's the Savior of all. His blood was shed, Brother Turner, for the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away, which taketh away the sin of the world. But you've got to receive it. You've got to receive it. Wednesday night, Sister Johnson was singing, and she sung two songs, and I, I was wondering maybe God had met with her also. Because the first two songs she sang up here Wednesday night, after I got up and exhorted for about two or three minutes, I later told her, I said, Sister Johnson, you just sung two of the four songs that I have some of the wording written down for my Bible lesson this coming Sunday morning, which of course is now. One of them is this, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. Do you believe that today? The second has a question and then it gives an answer. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ah, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I say thank God for the blood. Everyone say thank God for the blood. It washes whiter than snow. Uh, Isaiah said, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your skin, sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's Old Testament, but we can apply a New Testament meaning. We can bring our sin-ridden heart, our dark black heart to the Lord. I hear you, Lord. Holy Ghost is speaking to Somebody one time said they were amazed, Brother Bo, at how a black cow could eat green grass and give white milk. Someone else says, well, I'm amazed how a black, filthy heart of sin can be washed in the scarlet-colored blood of the Lamb and be made whiter than snow. I thank God there's power in the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing ah, but the blood of the Lamb. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. I believe it was Lanny Wolf years ago, if I'm not mistaken. He said it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. It goes on to say it will never 
lose its power. I thank God, Brother Johnson, my friend, there's power in the blood of the Lamb of God. Again, it is the powerful blood of Christ that maketh atonement for the soul. I jotted down some things. How powerful is the blood of Christ? I believe it can make a criminal a Christian. I believe it can make a sinner a saint, a pot smoker a preacher, a thief, a church treasurer. The blood of Jesus Christ can make a, a drunkard a deacon. The blood of Jesus can make an adulterer an altar worker. Ah, the blood of Jesus can make an evildoer an evangelist of God. Come on now. A crackhead can become a choir director. Paul said, but such were some of ye. But thank God we have been washed. We've been washed in the blood, but ye are sanctified. I believe, Brother Thomas, I'm looking at some sanctified folks that's been bought by, you cost God something. It was the precious blood of the lamb of high cost, of great worth, valuable, dear, and beloved to his people. Can you say amen? amen. But he said, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. Everyone say in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. The blood of Jesus Christ did what rivers, I will say rivers of the blood of bulls and goats could not do. I'll word it this way, Cleo, one drop of the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins, God with us. How many believe that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself? I'll say one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ did what rivers and gallons of blood of goats and bulls under the old covenant could not do. Thank God it didn't just cover sin. Chrissy, it didn't just roll sin forward to Calvary would one day take place. But thank God it took away the sin of the world. Uh, one man said, you have cast my sins behind your back. You cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. And somebody said he posted a no fishing sign. So when the accuser of the brethren comes along to fish out some past sin that you or I, Brother Joe, have done, he's trespassing because God, so to speak, put a sign, no trespassing Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren, but they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. I say thank God for the blood of Christ. Go ahead and clap your hands unto ah, the Lord our God. Ah, glory, glory, glory. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Man, I love the book of Hebrews chapter 10. I gave these verses late to our people up there in the sound, sound booth. I don't know if they got it for me or not. There it is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, I've already quoted it in part. The writer said, for it is not possible. That tells me each class that if it's not possible, it means that it is impossible. It is impossible or not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Sister Betty, how can a, I'll use the word, a, a dumb animal who doesn't know left from right and right from wrong, morals, how can that goat or that bull take away the sin of a man or a woman who knows right from wrong, who knows it's wrong to commit adultery or fornication or lie or steal and so forth? It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But go down to verses 11 and 12, and I'm going to slow it down here. Listen to what the writer said. And every priest, everyone say, standeth. When you look back into the tabernacle, Sister Turner, I know you study into the temple of Solomon. There were seven pieces of furniture in that tabernacle. Two were outside of the tabernacle proper. The brazen altar, the place of death, bloodshed, and suffering, 
then the laver, where they'd wash their hands and feet, and then the priest would go into the first sanctuary. To the left was a, was a golden candlestick. To the right was a table of showbread. Immediately in front of him, up against the veil of purple, blue, scarlet, and white, was the golden altar of incense. There was a dirt floor. The heavens were, I mean, the, the ceiling again was purple, blue, scarlet, white, with cherubims with their wings outspread over the priesthood and over the worshipers. Within the most holy place, commonly called the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle it was 15 by 15 by 15, a perfect cube. There was the, gold, there was the, uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and upon it was the mercy seat with the cherubims with their wings outspread. There was no furniture for the priest, Brother Johnson, to sit down on. Every priest, everyone say, standeth daily. That tells me that the work is not finished. That atonement that would take place on the cross of Calvary when the sins are literally taken away was not yet. So the priest would go and he would stand daily and they would offer oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, verse 11 and verse 4 of Hebrews 10. That implied or signified, Brother Joe, that again, the work is not finished. So the priest would go back out and every year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter in within the veil. I have to get on this subject another time. And he would take the blood, Sister Johnson, from the goat that was sacrificed at the brazen altar, and he would sprinkle the blood. Everyone say sprinkle. Seven times upon and before the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Covenant. And that high priest would stand there in silence. Some believe he might would utter Jah or Yah. But the blood would speak figuratively or symbolically. Brother Thomas, the blood would speak. The priest would then go back out, lay his hands on the scapegoat, confess the sins of Israel on the scapegoat, and a fit man would take that goat into a desolate place, let the goat depart, and the goat would leave never to be seen again. This picture is not only did Jesus die for our sins, but thank God he's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Ah, never to be remembered no more. I say thank God for the blood. Ah, but look at verse 12 if you'll put it up there. But this man, talking about Jesus, Yeshua, Jehovah the Savior, Jehovah's fellow, the Holy One, whose body did not see corruption, whose blood did not see corruption. After he had offered one, I hear you, Lord, Holy Ghost, I hear you, Lord. After he had offered one sacrifice for sin, what's that sacrifice forever for sins? His own body, his own blood. Jesus, Sister Betty, both Lamb and High Priest of God. As Lamb of God, he died on Calvary, shed that blood on Golgotha. Come on now. And on that resurrection day, God raised him from the dead and glorified him, made him a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, the theophany. And he told Mary, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended. You go tell my disciples I'm ascending to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. And keep in mind the Father's in the Son. God was in Christ. He's not leaving one place where God is not or the Father's not in order to be where God the Father is. He's moving from one place to another. He's going from earth to heaven into the holy places, and he's going to take his own blood, Sister Marcia, and he's going to sprinkle the mercy seat of God Almighty in what we call the holy of holies or the holiest. He's going to sprinkle his own blood upon the mercy seat in the holy places. That's powerful. Then he's going to just come back down. And for 40 days, he's going to appear to his disciples. Then he's going to be received up into glory. You know what he's going to do? Here's what he's going to do. He's going to sit down. It is finished. On Calvary, to Telestai, it is finished. In Koine Greek, 
common Greek. It means paid in full. Who liked it when you got your paper on your car and said paid in full? Your house note paid in full. A credit card paid in full. But thank God on Calvary, it was paid in full. The price was paid for our sins. Once was the offer to bear the sins of the world. Come on, one offering forever. And he sat down on the right hand of God. I say there's power, power, wonder-working power ah, in the blood of the Lamb. Go ahead and clap your hands unto the Lord our God and give him praise. Woo! Blessed Lord, blessed Lord, blessed Lord, glory, glory. As I was studying this, I went back to Adam and Eve. When sin entered, Sister Christy, there had to be bloodshed. Fig leaf wouldn't do it. Good works wouldn't do it. And if they had gold and silver, that wouldn't do it. It took a blood sacrifice. God slew, one man felt, a ram. Here we have an animal slain for individuals. Whether it was one for each one or one for both, it says skins, plural. But God Almighty slew, I hear you, Lord, Holy Ghost just gave me this. God slew the ram. God slew the lamb. And he took those, I'll say bloody skins, or definitely skins that had blood, and he clothed Adam, Adam, and Eve sacrifice for individuals. Then I see at the Passover, we're going to see a sacrifice for a family. God Almighty gave his people instructions. You take a lamb without blemish, without spot. It can't be blind. It can't be crippled. No sores, no boils. It had to be a spotless lamb for each family. And you slay that lamb and you take the hyssop and, all, and you dip it in the blood and you strike the doorpost and the lintel of each house. Some say it formed a cross. You stay within that house. You have your clothes on, your shoes are on your feet, your staff's in your hand. Because about midnight, the destroyer is coming I hear you, Lord. The destroyer is coming through midnight. He's going to go to each house, and where he does not see the blood of the lamb, he's going to smite the firstborn male child of every family. I say we have to have faith in the blood of the lamb. Amen. Egypt didn't have faith, but God's people had faith in the lamb, and they applied that blood upon the doorpost and the lintel of their homes. So when the destroyer, some say a death angel, the Lord said he would enter, but when the destroyer came to the houses of the Egyptians. There was no blood. Holy Ghost is speaking to me right now. People want to take blood out of the songs. They want to take the blood, Brother Dale, out of Christianity and polish it, make it look smooth and pretty. Calvary was an ugly sight to the, visual, to the natural eye. To the spiritual eye, it was a wonderful, beautiful thing that our Lord did. Greater love have no man than this, and man laid down his life for his friends. Holy Ghost is speaking. But Jesus didn't just die for his friends. He died for his enemies. So it took more than the love of man, the love of Christ and his humanity. It took the love of God in Christ to enable him to die for those that hated him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Aren't you thankful for that? But when the death angel or the destroyer came to the houses of God's people, there was the blood. You and I today, Brother Thomas, we're not appointed to wrath. Why? Because Jesus died for us. He shed his blood on Golgotha for you and I. And I say it's precious and it's powerful. When, so when the Lord looks upon his people, I'll say he sees the blood. Come on now. Thank God we're not appointed to wrath, but we're appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So we have individuals. Then we have a family. And on the Day of Atonement, we have a nation. I've already mentioned it. It was called Yom Kippur. Two goats were brought to the tabernacle of God or the temple later. And again, lots were cast. One would fall upon the goat to be the sacrifice. The other would be the scapegoat. And I've already said the goat would be slain, the high priest, one day a year would enter in within the purple, blue, scarlet, white veil. And again, I say he will sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. 
stand in silence in the presence of the eternal one, the Almighty. Then he would enter back out, walk back out, lay his hands again, I say, on the scapegoat, confess adultery, murder, idolatry, the sins of God's people. And it would be transferred symbolically to the goat from the people. And again, I say a fit man would take that goat and let him depart, and the goat would leave. But now at Calvary, I see a sacrifice, yes, for individuals, for families, for nations, but I see a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. I hear you, Lord. Holy Ghost is speaking. I was thinking, how many people are there alive today? Is it not over 6 billion? Now, you go all the way back to Adam and Eve. How many millions and billions of people have lived? How many sins have you committed in your life? You multiply that by billions. He took away every act of adultery was laid on him. Every act of homosexuality, of the gays, the lesbians, of murder and lying and stealing and cursing and violence, every sin that has ever been committed, is being committed right now while people are committing adultery while we're in this church. People are burning buildings down and killing people. And all the sins that will take place in the future, however long that will be, he's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I say there's power in the blood of Christ. Go ahead and clap your hands under the Lord. Is that a reality to you? Ah, blessed be his name. And again, Sister, not one drop rotted. Not one drop is in the shroud of Turin. I wish those that are watching could communicate with those men and say, hey, there's a preacher or a minister, a teacher, whatever you want to label me, that's got the answer. You're trying to figure out this blood. And they say it's kind of a unique blood they found. But let me tell you what, it's not the blood of Emmanuel. It's not Jesus' blood. I don't know what kind of blood it is, but our blood, he preserved, or his blood, he preserved for us. And again, I believe it's within his own glorified body and also was applied to the mercy seat in the most holy place. You ever notice a lot of people want to go to Pentecost and they don't go to Calvary. They want to come up and pray for the Holy Ghost and they go back and keep living in sin with someone. They go back to their, their lover and they come up here and stand and pray for the Holy Ghost and they leave. You cannot go to Cal, uh, Pentecost without going to Calvary. Brother Bo, you've got to go to the suffering Savior in the place of death and bloodshed. Now, I know UPC may differ with me, but I believe the blood's in the altar. When I look back in the Old Testament type, the blood of that Passover lamb was applied to the doorpost and the lintel of the houses of the children of Israel. Then they were led by the pillar of fire at night and the cloud by day to the banks of the Red Sea to be baptized under Moses in the cloud. There's your Holy Ghost baptism. And in the sea, there's water baptism. The blood was already there. I don't believe you can differ with me. God don't feel filthy, dirty, nasty, ungodly people with this Holy Spirit. I believe the Spirit follows the blood. You can agree or disagree. The blood is in the altar. The altar is Calvary. Can you say amen? And it was there that atonement, the appeasing sacrifice, the payment was made for the sins of the whole world. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his household received the Holy Ghost before water baptism. I've got to believe the blood has already cleansed them from their sins. Then you arise and you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That word for, that's the in-house debate. And you're buried with Christ by baptism into death. You must be baptized in his name, buried with him. But before you're buried with him, you've got to be crucified with him. You've got to die. So you cannot bypass Calvary. You cannot bypass true repentance and try to go to Pentecost. That is the receiving of the Holy Ghost. You're wasting your time. It will never happen. Do you believe that? I jotted down some other notes, and I'll just carry my notes with me. I got always have notes here. I love. Do you love the Word of God this morning, Cleo? You hear me at the other little church? I go, I go hour and fifteen minutes. Just get started. There's, pardon me for my my error, but 
I want to give you everything I know about every subject, and you just can't do it in 45 minutes. But here's what I jotted down. When the eternal spirit, the Eah, Asher Eah, I am that I am. When the great I am, the eternal spirit, the God of heaven and earth, whose spirit is in your body, is in your body, is in your body. Whom the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain, Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple. When he created, I'll start with the stars, it didn't cost him a thing. I have a Bible at home. It's called the Wycliffe Bible Commentary. I mentioned here once or twice before. In that commentary, Wycliffe, that they said this, that scientists estimate, I don't know how in the world they can get this number with, no, with the telescope, no matter how powerful it is, but they estimate there are, I think he said, 19 galaxies in the universe, but here I remember for sure, he said there are more than 100 quintillion stars. I didn't know there's such a number as quintillion or quintillion. Let's say this off by 99%. Brother Thomas, let's say it's only one quintillion stars. Now, aren't you thankful Psalm 147, 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Can you imagine naming a hundred quintillion stars? And he made them in one 24-hour day. Those were 24-hour periods. I'm getting off my subject. The evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. If they were millions of years, Adam and Eve would have been millions of years old by the time day six ended and day seven came along. But Adam was just a young pup. He was only 950 years old. I said that to say this. Those stars did not cost God anything. He didn't have to buy them purchase them, redeem them. When he made Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, when he made all the planets, the Earth, the Sun, the Moon, when he made the mountains, the oceans, the rivers, the streams, when he made, according to Revelation 5.11, over 100 million angels that are still on God's side, 50 million plus have already been cast down to torturous hell. Didn't cost him a thing. But when it comes to the church of the living God, Cleo, we cost God something. I thank God he has an investment in you and I. The Bible said, for you are bought with a price. I said, you are bought with a price. Ah, that's a precious and the powerful blood of Christ. He said, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We cost God something. Acts 20, Paul said he purchased his own church, or he purchased the church with his own blood. Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Thank God for the blood. Clap your hands unto the Lord our God. Ah, blessed be your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, glory, glory. And again, his blood speaks in the most holy place in heaven itself for you and I. Here's a few things. That I, let, me, let me read this and I'll read a few things. We've got a few, just a few more minutes here. It was Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1 that he prophesied, In that day there shall be, everyone say a fountain. Who knows what that fountain is? Open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. As the song stated, it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. I think it goes on to say, it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. Well, that's, that's true, but the power of God, the Holy Ghost gives us strength and power from day to day. But I say thank God for the blood. It washes whiter than snow. But he prophesied there would be a fountain that would be opened. That fountain 
came from the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Calvary. Brother Land, when he shed that precious blood for you and I, he purchased his own church with his blood. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the prophet of God gave a prophecy concerning the New Testament church, a new covenant, better yet, the new covenant. He said this, I will remember their sin no more. Sister Betty, you may offend me. I may say I forgive you, and hopefully I do, but to say that I would never, ever remember it, I don't know that I could say that, maybe. But when God forgives, when the Lord forgives, Cleo, when we truly repent, if you haven't repented, you're not forgiven. Somebody years ago kind of disagreed with me when I said, God will forgive you, but you've got to repent. And what we were talking about, if your brother sinned against you, you forgive him. I said, I don't think that we just forgive somebody that does not repent. The Bible said, if he repent, you forgive him. We're to be willing to forgive, and maybe we release it in our heart and mind, but for this transition to take place, that brother has to repent. And then you forgive him, not just seven times, but seven times 70, 490 times. You continue to forgive him, even if he says, I repent. But God does not forgive unless we repent. He's willing. He's already shed his blood. He's already paid the price. But he still requires repentance. And there we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Sister Turner, I believe where there's forgiveness of sins, there's the blood. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And forgiveness takes place before Water baptism and the Holy Ghost baptism. So I'll say the blood's in the altar. You can agree or disagree. But again, he said, I will remember their sins no more. And one man wrote in a book, he said, our sins are gone, gone, gone. That's powerful. Sister Robinson, gone, gone. One man said, well, it was David that said, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us, Psalm 103, 12. Brother Dale, how far is the east from the west? You tell me. I remember as a kid, I would think, and even now I think, say you go to the west, thousands of miles, millions of miles, where does it end? Where does it end? And if it ends, what begins? You go to the east as far as you can possibly go. Millions of miles, trillion, however far. So God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. And I've already quoted what Hezekiah said in Isaiah 38, 17. For thou hast cast all, I wouldn't say all, my sins behind thy back. I know that's figurative. But Brother Johnson, God's an omnipresent spirit. The heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And in him we live, move, and have our being. How can he cast all our sins behind his back? And he remembers them no more. I'm winding down here. I'm about through. Then in Micah chapter 7 and verse 19. And thou wilt cast, everyone say all. Their sins into the depths of the sea. And I've already mentioned that. Into the depths of the sea. And again, I say, someone said he posted a no fishing sign. And Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I've quoted that, Revelation 12, 11. So when Satan comes along, I think a song says, and he accuses you of some past sin that you've done, you can say, devil, I've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. He remembers my sin no more. I say thank God for the powerful blood of Christ. And it was John 1.29 that John said, Behold, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away, not just covered, but taketh away the sin of the world. Aren't you thankful for the atonement that we have through the precious blood of Christ. And in closing, I'm going to let you out about four minutes early. In closing, it was John that said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful. Come on. He is faithful, and thank God he is he's just, and he will forgive us for all unrighteousness. He will cleanse us and forgive us for all of our unrighteousness if we confess our sins. I thank God for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you clap your hands and give God praise this morning? Uh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, I'm going to go ahead and change the order of the service. I'm letting you out about four minutes early.